This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther Gidoy Yort. It's Tuesday, August 11th. This is Africa 54. Due to the global outbreak of COVID-19, Voice of America is taking every necessary precaution to safeguard its employees. So our broadcast will look a little different today and in the near future, as we, out of an abundance of caution, reduce our staffing at VO headquarters here in Washington. We're working to help keep you informed about what's going on, and we appreciate you staying with us on Africa 54. Scrambling to raise money for equipment and medicines to battle the coronavirus, the Namibian government, in a letter seen by Reuters, says it will auction its 60% share of the country's annual horse mackerel and hake output to the highest bidder by the end of October. The government's 60% quota is normally reserved for the state-owned company Fish Corps, which is marred in a corruption scandal. Albert Kawana, the Minister of Fisheries and Marine Resources, revealed in the letter to the fishing industry that his government needs financial resources on an emergency basis to mitigate the effects of COVID-19. Namibia does not produce medicine or manufacture medical equipment. Last month, government officials approached the International Monetary Fund for a $254 million emergency loan to help it tackle coronavirus. Namibia has seen a steady rise in new infections and now has over 3,000 cases of COVID-19 and 19 deaths, according to Johns Hopkins University data. Namibia's auction of the government's fishing quota would be the first of its kind in the country. The world has now topped 20 million infections of COVID-19, and the World Health Organization is calling on global leaders to take more action and for citizens to embrace new measures. Africa 54 health correspondent Linomu Du has the details. The World Health Organization Director General, Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus says it is never too late to control an outbreak of the coronavirus. Speaking at a briefing Monday, the head of WHO noted the scale of the COVID-19 pandemic with 750,000 deaths worldwide expected by the end of this week. Uh, this week we will reach 20 million registered cases of COVID-19 and 750,000 deaths. Behind these statistics there is a great deal of pain and suffering. Every life lost matters. I know many of you are grieving and that this is a difficult moment for the world. But I want to be clear, there are green shoots of hope and no matter where a country, a region, a city or a town is, it's never too late to turn the outbreak around. With over 5 million confirmed cases, the United States makes up more than 25% of the global COVID-19 cases. Brazil is second with the highest rate of infection, accounting for nearly 3 million cases. In Africa, there are over 1 million infections with 23,000 deaths, but more than 734,000 people have recovered from the disease. Every country has uh, uh, going through its own uh, situation. Um, indeed, uh, uh, the situation in South Africa uh, raises uh, a lot of uh, concern. Uh, as you know, WHO has just deployed um, a very uh, big team, uh, close to 50 people, um, to support the country in addressing uh, this uh, situation. Uh, but uh, we cannot uh, conclude uh, that uh, what is going on in South Africa uh, is going to repeat in other places. African nations joined together early in the pandemic under the African Union to find solutions for much-needed testing and medical supplies, as well as advocating for equitable access for any successful vaccine. South Africa has the highest number of cases in Africa, above 500,000. The country has Africa's most extensive testing and data collection, and yet a recent report by the South African Medical Research Council showed that many COVID-19 deaths were going uncounted. Observers say infections are likely significantly undercounted in other African countries, as well as in richer nations. If you are asked to stay home, please stay home. 
but if you do need to leave your house to do different things, to follow the national guidance. If you're asked to wear a mask and you go in shops or you go on public transportation, please do so. Um, if you could avoid crowded places, if you could avoid indoor settings with poor ventilation, manage your own risk. Reduce the opportunity for you to become exposed to this virus. The WHO says countries like France, Germany, South Korea, Spain, Italy and the United Kingdom have had major outbreaks of the virus but have been able to suppress it when they took action. Lenore Moudou, VOA News. As South Africa continues to ease coronavirus restrictions, technical experts and public health experts are working on plans to protect the health of the 14 million South Africans who rely on a complex network of regulated minibus taxis to get to work, school and more. Innovators and investors say this could be an African solution to a problem that affects millions of others in Africa and beyond. VOA's Anita Paul reports from Johannesburg. The humble minibus taxi is a lifeline for more than 70% of South Africa's workforce. But health experts worry this system is a breeding ground for coronavirus because of riders' close quarters and the high volume of passengers. A new South African nonprofit initiative, led by a businessman who is also the eldest son of President Cyril Ramaphosa, is trying to address this gap. When we insisted as business and as South Africans, let's open this economy, by not dealing with the commute, we basically undid what was happening with lockdown. So if you deal with the transport sector, because COVID is a, is, a, is a virus that moves through the transport sector, if you deal with that effectively, you could actually put in an artificial lockdown. HIV researcher Dr. Jenny pfeiffer Kutsia, founder and director of the African Potential Foundation, says her team has come up with several solutions, ranging from simple to complex. What we're looking at is a system very similar to what's being used in um, ambulances, and that is to, to adapt a UVC air filter that allows the airflow to be encouraged within the taxi using various fans within the filter, and air passes through the filter where it's then irradiated within a matter of seconds and is then um, transferred back out into the taxi to be circulated out within the taxi. The team is also considering an alarm system that alerts passengers to open the windows to allow fresh air to circulate, at sanitizing stations that passengers can use to clean their hands before boarding, and at a divider between the driver and passenger. That last intervention, says Ramaphosa's business partner Brad Fisher, is especially crucial. He says the government's efforts at sanitizing taxis only work up to a point. But you can spray this rank to death. Unless you get into the taxi, where there's a closed environment, it's a capsule with whatever it is, whether there's three or 10 people's academic. That driver gets sick and statistically, the driver's seen 2,000 people a month, again, he's gonna get sick. These measures, say Ramaphosa's team, could decrease the risk of infection by up to 80%. So far, SDI has fitted out 5,000 school transport taxis and 1,000 commuter taxis at an estimated cost of about $340,000, which works out to about $60 per vehicle much of it provided by donors. It, it's been quite a, quite a journey of discovery for us non-scientists to bring all these people together with one thing in mind. We need our people to get to work safely and we need to save lives. Pfeiffer Kutsia says the team is also looking at how to scale the model to fit other African countries, which use similar transport systems to move millions of people each day. Anita Powell, VOA News, Johannesburg. Public health experts agree, wear a mask, wash your hands, and observe social distancing. These are the guidelines to help control the spread of the coronavirus pandemic. But as VOS Arash Basadi reports, an anti-mask movement threatens containment of the highly contagious disease. Friday in Sturgis, South Dakota, the 80th annual Sturgis Motorcycle Rally rolled into town despite public health concerns of COVID-19. Rally goers didn't seem concerned about the advice of public health experts who say social distancing and mask wearing are key to controlling the spread of the virus that's now infected more than 5 million Americans. No, we didn't take any precautions um, as we normally don't. Um, we think the majority of this situation is manufactured. There's ulterior motives behind it. Rally goers like Jim Bush call risks of contagion overblown, despite mountains of public health evidence to the contrary. 
And good afternoon. My administration has... President Donald Trump has worn a mask in public on rare occasions. Leading U.S. infectious disease expert Dr. Anthony Fauci says safety regarding the coronavirus is simple. Avoid crowds of any type, no matter where you are, because that leads to the acquisition and transmission. And I don't judge one crowd versus another crowd. When you're in a crowd, particularly if you're not wearing a mask, that induces the spread. Yet a growing movement around the world challenges science and expert advice like those at this anti-mask rally in Stuttgart, Germany. I'm here because I believe in Jesus Christ. This whole coronavirus is an anti-Christ issue. It is mostly against our Savior, Jesus Christ. Many don't know that. They don't know that it is really against God. Others call for personal responsibility in protecting public health. I think it's so selfish. Actually, these rules are necessary at this period of time. Otherwise, this virus can spread so easily. Maybe for younger people, it's not that much awful or dangerous. But on purposely, we can affect other people. Locals estimate the crowd in Stuttgart at around 2,000, while back in South Dakota, local officials expect roughly 100,000 visitors to the 10-day Sturgis motorcycle rally, which usually draws about half a million attendees. Arash Arabasadi, VOA News, Washington. While the possibility of children returning to schools in person is being debated over coronavirus infection concerns, Parents are beginning to overcome their worries enough to take their children to pediatricians for routine evaluations and vaccines. Celia Mendoza visited a pediatric clinic in Patterson, New Jersey, where VOA gained unique access to the safety protocols to contain the spread of the virus. Pediatrician Gloria Mejia Ramirez is part of a family of doctors from Rio Hacha, Colombia, who founded the Kitty Clinic in Patterson, New Jersey, 30 years ago. During the peak of the pandemic, the office saw patients via telemedicine. They are seeing patients in person now, but in a very controlled way. One of the changes that has occurred is now that they are only seeing patients by appointment. We cannot have a full room. Only up to eight patients with relatives can come. At the entrance, the temperature is taken. The door remains closed different from how we worked before. Another change, we installed this glass to isolate the waiting room from all the staff inside at the front desk. Dr. Edgar Mejia says one of his big concerns during the pandemic has been for healthy kids who need important annual checkups and vaccines. We had to see children, especially the little ones, to vaccinate them. We need to avoid other diseases. If we don't, we're going to create another pandemic of diseases that have been under control. That's why we're convincing patients to begin coming to the office. Clinics like this one have begun to see patients again. Daily, around 80 of them are coming through these exam rooms, according to the doctors, who believe that the number is a direct result of the effort that has been made to guarantee the safety of minors. It took some parents time to feel safe enough to bring their children. We think we can catch it. The children are going to catch it. We thought all those things. But with all the measures that are being implemented, everything is fine. Marcia Isabel Rojas, who has three children, is still not certain if it is safe enough for them to return to school. Mejia Ramirez says wearing a mask and social distancing has become a part of children's lives. Children older than two years old already consider the mask as part of their clothing. They put it on, they take it off and do it all over again. They are aware of the situation. Many ask me for permission, doctor, is it okay if I go to the lake? You know, little things they say because of their innocence. It is unclear how much longer children will be required to take the protective measures and what the full impact of the pandemic on them will be. Celia Mendoza, VOA News, New Jersey. The Malawi High Court says the Malawi Electoral Commission should pay President Lazarus Chakwera and Vice President Saulos Chilima over $6 million as legal fees stemming from when both men challenged in court the results of the May 2019 presidential election. The MEC and the then ruling Democratic Progressive Party were the first and second respondents in the court challenge. 
The Malawi Nyasa Times newspaper quotes High Court Registrar Agnes Batemba as saying the MEC has 45 days to pay the legal costs. Malawi governance commentator Makumbo Muntali says the ruling means that Malawi taxpayers are going to put the bill for MEC's mistakes. Lawyers for jailed Zimbabwe journalist Hopewell Chinono and Jacob Ngarivume, leader of the Transform Zimbabwe movement, say they have petitioned the High Court to intervene in restoring both men their prison rights. The Zimbabwean government has accused Chinono and Garivume of preaching violence ahead of a planned July 31st protest against poor governance in Zimbabwe. Beatrice Mtetwa, the lawyer for Chinono, says authorities have denied the pair outside food, even though Zimbabwean law grants prisoners awaiting trial the right to bring their own food, denied warm clothing, private interviews with their lawyers, and access to their families. The Zimbabwe Prisons and Correctional Services says the measures are necessary to guard against the spread of the coronavirus pandemic. We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com still to come a children's books project on covid19 goes viral on social media we'll be right back your VOA health correspondent. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the World Health Organization says the best way to reduce your chances of being infected or spreading coronavirus is to wear a mask to avoid breathing any small liquid droplets which may contain the virus. Regularly wash your hands with soap and water or clean your hands with an alcohol-based hand sanitizer. For more information on COVID-19, visit who.int or contact your local or national health authorities. Welcome back to Africa 54. Lebanon's government has resigned after last week's devastating explosion in Beirut and reports of negligence by the country's officials unleashed a wave of public anger that added to months of unrest in the country. As Anchal Bora reports from Beirut, the resignation of the country's prime minister and his cabinet come as many Lebanese fear that hundreds of millions of dollars in international aid could end up in the pockets of the same politicians whom they hold responsible for the catastrophe. Thousands of protesters returned to downtown Beirut, the epicenter of protests which first began in October, and said they have had enough. Some called not only for the removal of the political class, but demanded the politicians be hanged. Many Lebanese accused the leadership of ignoring the warnings to dispose of the thousands of tons of ammonium nitrate that caused the explosion. The gigantic explosion left more than 150 dead, 5,000 injured, and as many as a quarter of a million homes destroyed. Nida Hakim volunteered to clean the streets. She tied a noose to her broom. This is the broom that I've been using to clean up the houses and the streets of the people who lost everything. And the noose is for the government that has killed us all, not just the people who died, but all of us, everyone living in Lebanon. 
Shortly after Saturday's demonstration began, security forces fired tear gas at protesters who tried to break the cordon around the parliament building. The protesters succeeded in storming the foreign ministry to vent their anger against the establishment. As the evening progressed, uniformed men beat some of the protesters and cleared them from the streets. Undeterred, the protesters were back the next day. The protesters want an international panel to investigate the explosion, saying they have no trust in their government. 21-year-old Izar Lahoud came out with his friends. He said he wants politicians dead or thrown out of the country. They are not thinking about us. They are thinking about their, their own duties and their, their selves, how to make money. But we are dying here. No politician cares. The international community is pledging millions in aid. But in a country where graft and mismanagement had already sparked months of unrest before the disaster, there is fear that the money may end up in the pockets of corrupt politicians. Anshul Vora for VOA News, Beirut. Texas, the second largest state in the U.S., continues to fight new cases of COVID-19. One rural county called Star at the Texas-Mexico border has been facing challenges that are different from those of more urban areas. VOA's Elizabeth Lee has the details. While many stores in the U.S. are desperately trying to stay afloat during the pandemic, Veronica Gonzalez's small business is booming. But she does not see it as a blessing. It's already 7 p.m. and uh, we've got um, funeral sprays to deliver tomorrow. And it's been increasing in our business, um, unfortunately. Gonzalez lives in the Texas border town of Roma with a population of less than 12,000. We're bordering Miguel Aleman, it's Mexico. Yeah. It's about three blocks from here. Roma and surrounding communities in Star County have been hit hard by the coronavirus, but the reality here is different from that in many other Texas counties. Star, one of the poorest counties in Texas, has a Latino majority. Often out of necessity, large families live together. The area also has one of the highest rates of diabetes and obesity in the state, so anyone who contracts COVID-19 is at high risk of complications. During the first two months of the U.S. lockdown, Star County barely saw any cases, says Dr. Jose Vazquez, the county's health authority. On a daily basis, we had one, two, three cases. It was a period of time from mid-April to May where we went for a 21 straight days without any single positive case in Star County. We had kept it very cool for the first couple of months. I think it just exploded. Then at the end of April, Texas started reopening its businesses. That, followed by two holidays and Father's Day, caused a surge in Star County's COVID-19 cases. We definitely noticed where very significant in the increase of number of cases. All of these family reunions, barbecues outside, pool parties. With only one hospital in the county and fewer than two doctors for every 10,000 people, the healthcare system in Star was overwhelmed. At one point in July, the county's top official announced on Facebook that doctors are going to have to decide who receives treatment and who is sent home to die. Vasquez says that is not happening. State and federal governments have stepped in. The Navy sent two medical teams to help. The Veterans Hospital in San Antonio, the second largest city in Texas, is also accepting patients from Star County. More than 20 people in the county have died of COVID-19, but actual numbers are higher, says Vasquez, because of paperwork delays. Now, unfortunately, we are seeing multiple fatalities within, within families itself. Further taxing Star County Memorial Hospital is the arrival of COVID-19 patients from Mexico. For us, every patient counts the same. For us, every patient's life has the same value than the others. It's been a ride. It's a very overwhelming. Gonzalez will do her part in helping comfort those who are grieving for their lost loved ones. Elizabeth Lee, VOA News. During the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, one mom in New York decided to transform the look of some children's books to reflect the new reality. Stephanie Trilling's project called Children's Books for Pandemics 
has gone viral on social media. Elena Wolf has the story, narrated by Anna Rice. It was like nothing he'd ever seen before. Shira and Zachary both know the story about the bear who ate a sandwich by heart. That and dozens and dozens of other kids' stories that they read with their mom in the long months of lockdown. At least, now they get to read outdoors. The strangest thing that we encountered um, was, and it's, it's going to sound like a very small thing, but in the mornings now, we're woken up by birds. A lot has changed this summer, some things forever. Trilling confesses that she has changed as well, turning from a constantly busy lawyer to a stressed out mom and an ironic illustrator. I took out a paintbrush and I started painting the first thing I saw, which was a book cover of a book we'd read earlier that day. And I started painting the characters and then I started painting um, pictures of what coronaviruses look like under the microscope. So my daughter looked over and she said, oh, wow, what is that? And that's how the project Children's Books for Pandemics began. Little Harold paints coronavirus purple, Little Engine is transporting PPE, and Frog and Toad keep their distance. Trilling is not rewriting kids' books, she is re-illustrating them. Good Night Moon was Good Night Zoom. That one was one of the most popular ones I've done, I think because in switching from an environment where everyone is working in offices, working late nights, not at home, um, to one where everyone is home with their children, with anyone else whom they live with. It's, it's a new environment and all of our interactions with people outside of our immediate households. By late July, Trilling has given a new look to about a hundred children's books, gaining popularity on social media and gaining friends among the parents that agree the new normal asks for new books for the kids who are now living through the unusual pandemic experience. In terms of returning to normal, I don't know what normal is going to be. It's not going to be what we left in February. Um, on, on the micro level, at birthday parties, I don't think people are going to be blowing out candles anymore. I think that is a bygone thing and our kids and our kids' kids are going to laugh when we tell them that, oh, we went to birthday parties and people flew germs all over the cake and then everyone ate it. Trilling's viral work is going to outlive the pandemic. The U.S. Library of Congress considers them artifacts and has requested to have the originals in storage, something that documents a very peculiar era in American history. For Elena Wolf in New York, Anna Rice, VOA News. That's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, thank you for watching.